going, everybody? This is Kevin Bradford, a.k.a. Kevin Corp, singer, songwriter, salesperson, slash budding entrepreneur. This is going to be a quick introduction, and then we're going to jump right into the interview. Go ahead, my friend. Oh, excellent. Well, that was a quick introduction. Hey, Kevin, thanks for taking the time to come here and uh, meet on Zoom. And uh, let's talk about Spellgrounds and Calsa Brain Games. For those who don't know, I'm Chop G. Kalsa, uh, one of the founders of Calsa Brain Games and creators of Spellgrounds. Awesome. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I'm so excited to do this interview. I've always wanted to talk to you about all of these things. So, so it's a funny story about the v uh, uh -huh. market. Um, uh, you know, we, um, you know, there was a hiatus where we really didn't produce mats for several many years. And uh, that would have come maybe between 2010 or so and, and maybe 2015, maybe, you know, maybe longer than that. And part of that was that we, we just couldn't get the fabric and, and, the, and the dynamics of the collectible card game market had also changed because the board game wave had come in. There wasn't as much demand. People were moving away from magic. Um, but um, so the, you know, and, and the last run we did was on this fabric that doesn't even have a name because it was so unpopular. <laughs> I don't even <laughs> know if people know this, but after V1, there was like a V1.5 or something. Okay. And uh, it was more rubbery. And I mean, sometimes I see them on eBay. Uh, it was m more like a faux leather that was kind of plasticky. And mm -hmm. we made the mats and they had a great backing on them, but they weren't, a v they didn't have the fuzz. They didn't have the hand and the feel mm -hmm. and uh, they weren't that popular. They were just single okay. at the time. So time slid away. And uh, one of my other jobs that I do uh, lets me travel a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in Philadelphia. No, Philadelphia. It was Pittsburgh. Okay. And just walking, um, this was probably, you know, it was right, whatever we came out with the first V2, it was right before that. Because walking down some street, there was a nice fabric store. And I said, well, I'll just pop in here and, you know, see, just for fun. Yeah. Um, and I popped in and lo and behold, they had like this roll of what was now called V2. And we're like, this is okay. fabric. And that person and that company became our supplier for several years for all the V2 stuff and the V3 stuff. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, but then that's the company that went out of business and shuttered its stores. V2 V3 ah. shut down because uh, that company closed. And uh, so it was just, again, blind luck that I stepped into that store at that time, said, let's just see what they have. And boom, they had it, you know, and that, that began the resurgence. Um, that's also about the same time somebody said to me, by the way, have you seen a spell ground on eBay? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't really. <laughs> <laughs> As you ima can imagine, as you know, uh, mm -hmm. I looked on eBay and I was like, wow, that's uh, 500 bucks for a spell ground. Who knew? Um, yeah, the secondhand market was real and you had no idea. And that All those sort of down years, you know, just kind of brought it back. Yeah, yeah. Now, and how does it feel to see that? Like, those, these are like your babies, I imagine. And then you see that they're loved enough that there's an actual secondhand market. And you know, that's a, that's a great question, Kevin, is, um, it, it, you know, it's a, there's a great feeling about that, that, that I, in my own little small pond, have contributed to the gaming world in some way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Ultra Pro, these guys, you know, they've made a, a 20, 2 million mats a year. God knows what they make of those rubberized mats. And they're, you know, they got good pictures and stuff. They're not a spell ground. And I just love knowing that people who love our mats just understand that they are really special. You know, uh, it's, it's a great feeling. It's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, it, I want to know. How did it feel to be recognized by Magic the Gathering and being asked to make the World Championship play mats? Because that's huge. It was huge. Um, it was really interesting. We had a pretty, pretty dynamic relationship with the Wizards people. Um, there were several people in, in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, who ended up going on to work at, Mad at Wizards. Uh, a guy named Andrew Finch. Um, and everybody knows uh, uh, 
Mark, what's his last name? Oh, well, he's involved in Wizards. And a lot of these people, because we're all just young kids, just like designing stuff um, mm -hmm. and doing, doing what we do. And, you know, so with Wizards, um, because we kind of knew some people there and they were a small company at first, you know, and until they, and, you know, uh, so there, one thing that we did is we, we, be, before they asked us to do the world's map, we actually licensed with them to do the magic, the gather, official magic gathering play map. And that, okay. that is, that's a really beautiful map. And, and maybe, you know, maybe my favorite map, uh, Okay. It's sadly a map we can't reproduce because it's, uh, you know, it's got a lot of copyright stuff in it from from Wizards. But when we made it and we had the license to produce it for Wizards, it was beautiful. Um, and uh, we did the artwork on it. We had a local artist design it. We we created, you know, he, he was able to take all the images from, uh, you know, the, the Wizards stuff because they own those rights. And then they, he kind of put them into this design. Um, and so that was a beautiful mat, and that was, uh, you know, part that was part of our dynamic with Wizards that we had this license to do that, and we would send them money every month. Unfortunately, yeah. we lost that license because, uh, again, we're we're kind of a boutique company; we're not yeah. selling a million of these things. And when they got sold to Hasbro, uh, you know, Hasbro was like, "Yeah, sure, you can keep this license, but we want a hundred thousand dollars upfront per year." Oh my. Uh, and you know, there's no way we we don't sell a hundred thousand dollars you know per year per you know maybe we came close once i don't know <laughs> but uh th that wasn't going to happen for that one mat and so we lost the license to that and that you know oh well um but there's another story okay about wizards and and uh i posted this on the facebook page and you know some people pay attention or not but we we uh call the brain games slash Manifest okay. uh, were one of the only one of the two only ever authorized magic expansions not created by Wizards of the Coast. Okay, by Kevin, but it's called Edge of the World, okay. uh, and it's on the Magic Rarity site. I think a picture of every card is on there. Um, so we uh, produced this convention ninety four, ninety five, ninety six, and I think it was ninety six that uh, one of our fans who had come to the convention and come to the gaming stuff, uh, a guy named Don Vaccarino, he yeah. had designed a magic expansion all on his own. And he came to us and said, look, I get this whole expansion. You, you know, all we need are artists and permission from wizards to do it. And so we hired a bunch of artists. Uh, but before that, we reached out to wizards or I reached out to them and said, hey, we got this uh, expansion. What we want to do is print it on black and white stickers. And uh, we're going to the, give the stickers away free to people who come to our convention and play in this very limited edition uh, tournament, draft tournament. Okay. And uh, then they would put the stickers onto a uh, land card and play with it in the tournament. Pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. they, they wrote us back and said, we think it's a really fun idea. You have our blessing. You can produce these, and oh, wow. yeah. So we, I actually have a copy of that letter. It's like authorized from Wizards to create this expansion. It's really one of the only two authorized that weren't created by them. Uh, and additionally, Don Vaccarino, uh, again, a brilliant designer. A lot of his designs in that card, uh, that expansion, in Edge of the World, got incorporated into Wizards cards later. Um, but it, he went on to create. Uh, a card game called Dominion. Okay. So he created Dominion, and I'm sure there's some Dominion players out there. It's a uh, uh, deck building game, and uh, then there's like a bazillion expansions to that. And he, you know, and he was at one point that game was hugely popular, and still is. Uh, so he was, you know, he's that guy. You know, we we start. There was all these people from like San Francisco on the West Coast that, you know, were just passionate about gaming. And and it followed where that took us, and you know, game design. Yeah, and look now, you know, and look at you now. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just really fun, been really fun. I love gaming. And did you ever think back then that you'd end up where you are now with all of these stories, all these crazy adventures? You know, uh, 
no, no. You, I, I'm such an in the moment kind of person. It's like, we're doing this, we're doing that now. I mean, another thing that I did, you know, I remember sitting at the, sitting at the coffee shop playing magic. <laughs> and I don't even know where I got this from somehow, but I, I figured out there was a place that was selling magic art, the original magic art from the artists. And that they, you know, like um, Sarah Angel or whatever, you know. And I, had, I at one point had the largest collection of magic art, original magic art, you know, that, of anybody, I think, you know, just because I loved it. And, and it was amazingly cheap. It was like $200 for an original art piece. And, you know, years later, I don't know, I ended up selling all of that back to uh, Peter Atkinson, who's the founder of Wizards of the Coast. And okay. still has it, uh, but it might be in the Gen Con Museum or the Wizards of the Coast Museum at this point. But sold all that stuff. That's so out. cool. Yeah. So the next one is, uh, I think you touched on this, but I want to ask this anyway. What was the inspiration you used to create the fabric? Uh, the fabric, sorry, not the fabric of the mats, the fabric mats and the design specifically. Where did you come up with the design? What was your inspiration? You know, the design is, is uh, that's a good question because uh, uh, again, in sort of Jeff Brain's uh, interview, you know, what I remember is he kind of walked up and I had this piece of fabric on the table and he said, hey, I could, I could put some art on that. I'm like, oh, wow, how cool, you know? And, and I don't know if he just hand drew some art on it and then we're like, wait a minute, why don't we take this next step? Um, but I think, because uh, I'm not an artist, I, I can do Photoshop, I can do stuff like that, uh, but I, I can't draw. And uh, the same. art direct, you know, tell people what I like. And, you know, one of those things that he, he mentioned, it came out early and it's, it, it is a, it's a keystone of what our designs are, is that, you know, and it, it also echoes back to how, how I originally got introduced to magic and how much I said I, I love the art on the card. It's, I, I didn't want to have a mat that made the play area so busy that, mm -hmm. that the, yeah. the cards was lost, you know. That's why I'm not really a fan of these super bright mats. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah I'm in the same boat with that. Uh, I, like, I like the borders. I like my borders a lot. A little border, open area. We kind of wanted to have a divider, you know, so the, the magic thing shooting across to each other, pretty cool. Uh, can't bump my mic there. And, uh, and, you know, design wise, I, I don't, uh, I think really a lot of that was, was on Jeff and that I, I did at the, it was, I was early into uh, computers at that time, uh, uh, Macintosh stuff. And I, I do believe that I, I scanned a bunch of the stuff he gave me and pieced it all together. It gave me a little flexibility to kind of uh, manipulate what he was giving me. Um, uh, but then, you know, the, like he said, the challenge was actually, you know, I didn't know anything about screen printing. And he had his friend, Jody, and, you know, we got the first batch done. And that was, that was a good stuff. And then we moved on to another company that was right near his house, as he mentioned. And that was a lady who did our screen printing for years. And she was fantastic. She was, uh, just took a lot of care uh, in, in how that happened, you know. Okay. Now, I want to know this personally. What is your favorite mat that you have created? And if you can't choose one, give me three. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, they're probably the, in some ways the favorite mat is the classic design because it's so iconic. And it, you know, it's so easy to, to not just make it, but, you know, we don't have to, quote, sell it because it's just a spell grunt. People know what it is, you know, uh, yeah. that. And, and it's kind of stood the test of time as a design. Uh, but as I mentioned, I think I really do. Um, one of my favorite mats was, is the Magic Gathering mat. It was, uh, um, I, I did a lot of, I did a lot of the work on it with, from, with Photoshop. And uh, actually it wasn't Photoshop at the time, but uh, computer graphics stuff. And, uh, and the art direction on that was really a challenge, really a challenge. We had a, an artist who was talented, but like a lot of artists, it's, you know, the, it's hard to get them to produce sometimes. 
<laughs> yep. Sorry, to, <laughs> nothing against all artists. It's not it's somber. I, honestly, if you're if you're a, a, an aspiring artist, uh, this is a piece of advice for you from Chapchi Calso. Oh boy, uh, if you're an aspiring artist, I think the absolute best thing you can do to be successful is communicate with your clients and deliver product. Because uh, you know, I I can't tell you how many artists have done something for us and then it's like well didn't like working with that person they didn't deliver or they took too long and and uh, that's unfortunate because I think you know that kind of skill the creativity that it takes to be an artist is a certain mindset and and it's really important to to, if you want to be successful and make money being an artist to to challenge yourself in ways that pushes you into the business side of things and the business side of things is simply be answering emails, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that Matt, the magic, the gathering Matt, and I'll put some, see it up on the screen here are uh, there. There's so many elements in it that are uh, there. And, and the back of the labeling had uh, an, a list of what every figure was that made it into that piece. You know, we had all of the iconic, uh, images from the first edition magic and uh, and that kind of is why I like uh, my second favorite you know I like the classic as I said but my second favorite Matt would be uh, the elite that Jeff talked about with the poisonous plants because that also was just a, a really inspired take on a play mm-hmm. mat and and uh, on the back of that label we also had a list of every poisonous plant that was represented in uh, the cool. image and uh so those are two just really cool mats and you uh did you print that on v1 the elite the elite was on v1 um in the jeff brain i'll post it here uh take a look at this it's it's an ad that we did with v1 or uh, with the elite and the spellground and that was uh we probably put that into shadis magazine and the duelist magazine uh, we did run ads for it. I mean, you know, an interesting thing from a business perspective, you know, we used to sell wholesale. Um, that's okay. the way you would get into the gaming business back in the nineties. You, you, you know, there was no internet where you could just create a fantastic product and people come to your website. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you would, <laughs> so it, if you're looking at those mats at $15, the price we would get per mat was like $7. Okay. And it's, you know, to think back on that, it's like we made money, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't like we're making money, you know, like we do now, you know, uh, yeah. direct. We just don't go through distributors anymore. The game stores don't know how to sell our product anyway. Um, <laughs> That's fair. For fans is really the way to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, and it's funny.